Victoria Station, the station we all love, and yet we all leave at some time in our travels abroad. If we're fortunate or just comfort conscious, we leave by Golden Arrow, that 22 carat service which wings us to the continent in all the first class comfort that Pullman can conjure. And surely conjure is the right word to use in connection with this world-renowned service which daily links the two chief capitals of Europe. So, here we come, we the miscellaneous crowd of fortunate travellers, to take our places in that glittering train. Up in front, the polished proud locomotive teams impatiently for the signal to start. And prompt to the second, we're off. discover that the Trianon bar car on the train is the most friendly of rendezvous, a place to enjoy a soothing piano frappe or a homely light ale as we speed southward. Soon London's grime gives place to placid skies and green pastoral landscapes, and with appetites stimulated by our aperitifs, we may take a snack served right at our table. We find it difficult not to succumb to that insidious sensation of pleasure which is the sum total of all those little differences which distinguish the golden era. England's Garden County gladdens our eye as we dash southwards to the sea. Meanwhile, down at Dover, the cross-channel ship Invicta has been awaiting us at the quayside. Invicta, our ship, the ship with most honourable war service to our credit. From the earliest hours, Invictus crew have been busily preparing for our coming. Decks have been scrubbed immaculate with water from the cold salt sea. And with commendable energy, brasses have been burnished in true nautical fashion so that they reflect the perfection of the service. So that the pangs of hunger need never assail the golden arrow passenger, stores and victuals which will later grace Invictus tables have been loaded in readiness for the crossing. Down in Invictus bowels, the engineers stay beautifully at their task, oiling, maintaining her sturdy engines and preparing her oil-fired boilers. cooks, the galley slaves they call themselves, have been preparing the meals whose appeal none can deny, save perhaps those who feel more urgent calls when Invicta puts the sea. And there she lies, fresh and glowing, ready to the last deck chair, awaiting the fortunate traveller's arrival. For the convenience of those who like to motor abroad, Cars can be swung aboard and stowed in Invictus hold, although most motorists prefer to use the Dover Boulogne service or the train service where special facilities are offered them. But in any case, Invicta welcomes car or lowly motorcycle with equal hospitality. She's truly democratic. At last Invictus patience is rewarded and the fortunate traveler's train steams in. Now our real adventure is about to begin. Dover's brine-drenched air is in itself a bitter-sweet foretaste of continental travel. So here we are, a cosmopolitan crowd, good-humoured, jostling with our baggage clutched guardedly in our careful hands, unless, of course, we placed it confidently in the charge of the urbane porter. Passports next. Excitement mounts absurdly. And then come those little customs anxieties. Then, with hearts relieved and tripping to a joyous syncopated rhythm, we embark. Tickets are exchanged for landing passes, and soon the siren pipes an impatient warning of departure. Skipper and his officers wait watchful on the bridge. Stand by, orders the bridge telegraph. And down in the depths, the engineers re-echo, stand by. All 
almost imperceptibly, so smooth is her motion, Invicta is pulled away from the quayside by her own winch working on her bow. We're away, and somewhere down forward, the deck hands cast the last cable off into the sea. Skipper gives a new order, half ahead. Half ahead it is, sir. And again, down in the depths, the engineers obediently execute his command. of England's white cliffs, a last sentimental pang of nostalgia, then skipper orders full speed ahead. With her engine throbbing, and Victor plows her way through the searching waters. While we, the fortunate travellers, thrill in vague anticipation of adventures to come, the engineers stay watchful at their familiar task. Up above in the chart room, the ship's officers with their maps their cabalistic calculations and their own peculiar instruments check and recheck as they log any variation from the normal course. All the experience of the merchant navy lies behind the certainty of our safe arrival on the other side of the channel. Both for our safety and our convenience, radio keeps us in worldly touch. And another thing, radar. Just one of those things we accept unthinkingly. Radar provides a further shield for our protection. So while the kiddies play, whose kiddies? Oh, just anybody's. While they play on the sunlit deck, we maturer ones promenade or rest contentedly as fancy takes us. To while away the hours crossing on this short sea route, maybe we seek the sun lounge and take a little refreshment from the steward's obliging hand. Or maybe we go below to the dining room and, defying a villain mal de mer, choose and eat a meal far more comprehensive than the norm to which we, the austerity condition, have grown accustomed. 